At this time, if you are able and willing, if you'll stand for the reading of God's word. Today we'll be in Psalm 129. Greatly have they afflicted me from my youth. Let Israel now say, Greatly have they afflicted me from my youth, yet they have not prevailed against me. The plowers plowed upon my back, they made long their furrows. The Lord is righteous, he has cut the cords of the wicked. May all who hate Zion be put to shame and turned backward. Let them be like the grass on the housetops, which withers before it grows up with which the reaper does not fill his hand, nor the binder of sheaves his arms. Nor did those who pass by say, The blessing of the Lord be upon you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. At this time, I'd like to welcome up our lead pastor, Billy Glosson. Will you join me in praying for him, please? God, I just thank you for Billy. I thank you for the words that he will share with us this morning, God. We know that they're your words. I pray um, that, that he would have the humility to, to hear you as you speak, God, and share that with us. We thank you for his leadership, as we've, as we've discussed this morning, God, um, that he is following you and therefore can lead us in the right direction. God, thank you for this family that is Coram Deo. I pray that we leave here today encouraged, humbled, and ready to um, attack this week with blessings, God. Just thank you for all that you do for us. We love you. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. So we are continuing on in the Psalms of Ascent. And it is basically, the way to think about this is it's kind of like a you know Spotify playlist for ancient Jewish pilgrims who are making their journey to Jerusalem three times a year to gather and to worship. And so today we come to a psalm that seems kind of weird, right? We, we've had some you know, sad songs, some somber emo songs as we've gone through this. We've had some, some joyful, boisterous songs, and now we get kind of an angry song, right? It seems a little odd in the midst of all this, but really what this psalm is about is it's a psalm of perseverance. Eugene Peterson says it's a psalm about a stick to Now, something about me, uh, I can be the kind of person that gets really into things and then kind of lets them fade. What do I mean? Well, when I was doing college ministry, I thought, you know, a way that I could really connect with college students is by longboarding. I mean, look at me. I look like a guy who would longboard, right? I should get a longboard. And then I talked to my wife. We started, I'm like, hey, it's for ministry, right? It, it, like, it'd be totally something I would do. Sure enough, after saving, throwing a couple gift cards at it, I bought an expensive board, and I think I skated maybe three times <laughs> ever. Or, actually, there's that one time I thought, you know what I want to do? I want to go play disc golf. I'm going to go out with some friends. I'm going to rip some discs. It's going to be great. I'm going to have a fun. And instead, what happened is I just amassed a bunch of plastic discs, and I'm no good at throwing any of them. I've gone maybe, again, like four or five times, and it's been embarrassing. Or the time I thought, I'm going to really get into mountain biking, right? I got a bike, and I, I was, like, really focused, got a really cool helmet, got these really sweet fingerless gloves, this giant water bottle, so I would be, you know, like, hydrated as I'm out there. I was accessorized out, and my bike got stolen. But, if I'm honest, I think we've seen my kind of stick to is not the best, so I really wonder what would have happened there. But, this psalm is saying that our God is just the opposite. Our God finishes what he starts. This psalm reminds us of the need to stick to it, to persevere in the midst of persecution, in the midst of adversity. The idea we are going to see today is that God enables the perseverance of his people. God enables the perseverance of his people. And the reason we keep going is not based on our grit or our determination. It's because the Lord is with us. The Lord is with us. All boasting goes only to God, only to him who is on the side of his people. We persevere because of his grace. Now, this psalm is divided into two parts. It starts kind of retrospectively. The, the, the psalmist looks back at the affliction and the pain that his people, God's people, have endured. And then he moves forward and he gives a gut wrenchingly honest prayer. 
So let's go to the psalm and first see the affliction of God's people. Uh, Verse 1, Psalm 129. Greatly have they afflicted me from my youth. Let Israel now say, greatly have they afflicted me from my youth, yet they have not prevailed against me. The plowers plowed upon my back. They made long their furrows. The Lord is righteous. He has cut the cords of the wicked. This psalm is, again, starting by looking at the past. It's a call and response of the difficult moments of Israel's past. If you've been at Coram Deo, you know sometimes we'll do this. Michael will be up front. I will be up front. Someone will be up front. And we'll say, hey, please read the underlined portions. We'll give a call, and then we ask the congregation to respond aloud to us. It's an ancient liturgical practice that both ancient Jews and Christians have done. And this is a really weird one. <laughs> like, right? It starts off by saying, greatly have they afflicted me from my youth. Everybody, let's say it together. It's like, wait a minute. What's going on here? It's a, it's a call and response. Because they want to look back on Israel's past and see that from bondage in Egypt, right, all the way from the beginning to captivity in Babylon, God's people have endured various trials and afflictions in a broken world. And even though all this affliction has come, Israel still stands. This is a moment where God's people are singing about their affliction, about their pain. They know that God has walked with them in the midst of hard moments, in the midst of difficult days. And the Lord doesn't want them to forget their history. He also doesn't want them to despair and to quit when faced with present affliction. This psalm confesses, I've been afflicted, but I can have comfort. I can have hope. Now, when we read this, we see that we too are part of the people of God and that we can join in this song. You see, the Christian church was born in affliction. If we go all the way to the book of Acts, we see that it isn't long after the church is birthed that there's beatings and martyrdom. Even now, the church is persecuted throughout the world. There are those who speak the gospel, who read God's word in fear of real persecution. Consider Paul's words to the church In Corinth, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Now that's an awesome verse. Makes me think of a War of Ages song. That's for another time. But this psalm, it speaks a truth that reverberates among God's people. God enables us to persevere. God enables us to persevere. You see, Paul realizes that suffering is not senseless. It's not purposeless. Affliction and suffering, carrying about in our bodies the death of Jesus, it has the divinely ordained purpose of showing to a watching world the power of the resurrected life of Jesus. You see, every time you suffer persecution, every time you suffer indignity, every time you suffer pain, it's an opportunity to show to everyone that Christ has been raised from the dead. Because it's an opportunity to seek the grace of God in Christ to restrain your pain, to restrain your trouble, and to bring you through it with victory. See, God allows affliction in your life because he wants to show the world the power of the resurrection at work in you. When you realize that, it gives you an entirely different approach, an entirely different outlook on every difficulty you face in your life. There was a little boy whose legs were not developing as they should. And when the parents took him to the pediatrician, they were told that their son needed to wear a leg brace It would position his legs and his feet to grow properly. So the parents, they're like, hey, we want to do the right thing. We want to love our kid well. But every single night, they knew their son would be absolutely and utterly miserable. The bar held the little boy's feet and legs completely straight, unbendable. Can you imagine that, trying to sleep like that? Each night when his parents would put the brace on and put him to bed, the little boy would look at them and cry and ask, why? He hated it. He disliked it so much. 
The little boy was, was sure to have felt that his parents were treating him terribly, wrongly even. Possibly he laid there even doubting their love for him. And the mother at times would look at the monitor and see the boy struggling and be tempted to go in and take off the bar. But she resisted because she knew that what she was doing was right for her son. As difficult as this moment was, the doctor, the mother, and the father, they did what they did because of their concern and their thought for the future of this child, for his well-being for years down the road. And years later, reflecting on this pain, this little boy was now grateful that his legs were developed well. All because his parents were willing to sacrifice convenience now for a better life later. Friends, God cares for his children. We know this instinctively, right? Those of us who've been around little ones who seek to discipline, please don't run into the road. It's not because we want to spoil the fun. Right now, God might use means of restraint and discomfort to achieve his desired result, but he operates out of a deep, profound love. Friends, he is working resurrection in our lives. Your trials are no longer something to be endured with your teeth gritted and your heart heavy. They are opportunities to say to the world, Jesus is alive. And what makes this psalm beautiful is it's just this one little word, this little bitty three-letter word, yet, yet. It's so beautiful. Greatly have they afflicted me from my youth, yet they have not prevailed against me. Now for us as the church, here's what we read. Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus speaking to Peter after he makes this confession that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus says, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, what's the rock? The statement that he is the Christ, the Son of God, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The corner of Jesus has always been about the preservation of his people, the church. He is at work in you, even in the most difficult moments. Legan Duncan says it so helpfully and beautifully, reflecting on this psalm. He says, as Israel was born into suffering in Egypt, so God's one true son went to Egypt, into Egypt in suffering also. Remember, when Jesus was born, they were slaying the firstborn sons. Any child under a certain age, his parents fled immediately from the moment he was born. He would then leave Egypt, return to his people, live in suffering, and then die in suffering. Why? Because Jesus is the fulfillment of all the suffering servant songs of the Old Testament. Now we've said that this Psalm of Ascent, right? Every time we look at these, these are the songs of Jesus. These are the songs that, again, Jesus was a Jewish boy traveling with his family to worship in Jerusalem. He sang these songs. And this song is no exception. Look at verse 3. The plowers plowed upon my back. They made long their furrows. Israel remembers the sting of the whip from their oppressors. But as Jesus grew, singing this psalm, he knew that one day the Roman soldiers would truly plow his back with horrible wounds. He was familiar with the suffering servant songs. Consider this from Isaiah, Isaiah 50, verse 6. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. Coram Deo, Jesus was afflicted for us. Yet, in it all, God was righteous, carrying out his plan of salvation for his church, the exaltation of his son and the destruction of his enemies. So here's the hope. Here is the hope for dark moments. We can endure affliction with great hope because Jesus Christ has already suffered the ultimate affliction on our behalf. Friends, that's the gospel. 
That's the heartbeat of why we gather, why we sing, why we celebrate. It's that Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. Isaiah says that Jesus was struck down by God and afflicted. Isaiah 53, 4 says that. He was oppressed and afflicted as he offered up his body and his blood on behalf of sinners. And because of Jesus' atoning death, because of his glorious resurrection, any and all affliction, any and all pain, any and all suffering we face on this earth, friends, guess what? It is short-lived. Because we will eventually prevail over the grave because Jesus has prevailed. And any suffering we face in this short life, we can find grace through Christ to endure it. Therefore, Coram Deo, let's labor with humble, Christ-centered confidence. He will cause us to persevere. How do we know this? Because the Lord is our preserver. Look at verse 4. The Lord is righteous. He has cut the cords of the wicked. So despite the affliction... The psalmist says that the Lord, the righteous one, he's intervened. He's preserved his people. He is faithful to his promises. Not only that, he hears the cries of his people in distress. This is what's so helpful and beautiful. In pointing the people to the character of God, the psalmist is teaching all of us a great lesson here. It's this. In seasons of trials, dwell on the Lord's attributes. Dwell on his work in history. Dwell on his promises. Do you know there are approximately 8,810 promises in the entire Bible? In the Old Testament, there's 7,706. And in the New Testament, 1,104. Deuteronomy 28 alone has 133 promises, more than any other chapter in the Bible. It's been said we're sitting on the premises when we ought to be standing on the promises. See, Cormdale, we stand on the promises because we're told that they find their yes and amen in Jesus. Friends, he is righteous. He is a rescuer. So friends, let hope arise and ponder his ways. One way that it's been said that I think is so beautiful, I think this is C.J. Mahaney, it says you will need good theology in dark moments. See, if we don't do this work of resting in God, digging in his word, knowing what he says to be true, knowing his character, knowing that the enemy has been using the same lie since the garden, is God really good? And we go to his word and we see absolutely yes and amen, and I will believe it despite the affliction and hardship. You will need good theology in dark moments. So now we come to the second part of this psalm. Two, we see a prayer for God's people. Look at verse five. Look at verse five. May all who hate Zion be put to shame and turn backward. Let them be like the grass on the housetop, which withers before it grows up, with which the reaper does not fill his hand nor the binder of sheaves his arm, nor do those who pass by say, the blessing of the Lord be upon you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. This is what's known as an imprecatory psalm. Now, this isn't as intense as some of the psalms. Some of the psalms literally say, break his teeth. That's maybe the thing you've said when someone cuts you off in traffic. That's not what's happening here. It's a little different than that. Instead, this is in view of the seriousness of opposing God's people The people call down destruction on the enemies of God with three specific curses. First, they plead for those who hate Zion, i.e. those who hate God's people, right? To be shamed by defeat, to be turned back in retreat because Israel will be victorious. The second thing is they plead for those who afflict God's people to be useless like grass on the rooftops. Now, hopefully you don't have grass on your roof, right? Maybe you've got some in your gutter. We'll talk about that later. That's fine. Uh, Roofs were flat during this time, and the grass would sprout for a season in the shallow dirt. But what would happen is as the sun beat down on it, it would look like many of our lawns do right now, brown and withered. The grass would not grow anymore. It would grow up fast and then be useless. The reaper didn't have to come and cut it down or bind it into sheaves because it just withered away. 
The psalmist then is praying for the enemies to be scorched and fruitless. For the enemies to, that harmed God's people to no longer be able to. And finally, they plead for the enemies to remain unblessed. That's what we see in verse 8. Now, all of that might seem extremely harsh, right? You're like, well, no one's ever told me to pray for my enemies like that. Noted, Pastor Billy. No, that's not what I'm saying. Um, the question is, are we supposed to pray curses on others? Is that the, that the application from this? I think a better way to understand this psalm is to see what the goal of the prayer is. This is a prayer that is focusing on the triumph of God's name. Now let's take this passage of scripture and let's consider it in the context of all scripture, specifically for us this side of Calvary. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6 is a call for us to, to, to suit up and be ready for the warfare that we wrestle. This is what it says in verse 12. For... We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Psalm 129 pits the kingdom of God against the kingdom of darkness. Friends, what we are praying for ultimately is the destruction of our true enemy, the evil one and his minions. See, Jesus teaches us to pray, your kingdom come. And to pray this necessarily implies praying for the destruction of evil, praying for the destruction of the kingdom of darkness. This is a psalm asking God to be God, to bring an end to evil, to not let it flourish, to preserve and care for his people. It's an honest psalm. It's a psalm spoken out of pain in a moment where evil has deeply afflicted and broken God's people. So Quorum Deo, is this your prayer? Do you pray that evil would be undone? Right, when Jesus tells us to pray for our enemies, are we praying in such a way that Satan's rule, the darkness that grips people's hearts would break? Or are we praying for political power and a temporal kingdom? Do we pray for the flourishing of God's kingdom? Do we pray for those who are afflicted in their faith? Have you lost confidence in God? And seeing all your afflictions, are you missing the redemptions? Are you seeing evil abound and losing heart? Or do you scroll on your phone and you see, man, all these people who want nothing to do with Jesus, who have dishonest gain, they're flourishing and growing. Where are you, God? Several years ago in Texas, there was a pilot who left the motor running on a plane. And somehow, through autopilot or otherwise, the plane engaged itself. It was without a pilot, and it took off. It was flying on its own. Here's the thing. It stayed in the air for over 90 minutes. And then the inevitable happened. It ran out of gas. It crashed, and it was totally destroyed. For a while, you can fly on your own. For a while, you can take off. You can be somebody. For a while, you can act like God does not exist. And for a while, you can play a little religion, not be serious about submitting yourself to the world, to the to the Lord. And for a while, you can fly. No, there are atheists. There are those who practice uh, maybe dishonest gain, different means, and they look like they're flying. I know sometimes we we look at evil people and we say, how come they can be so evil and they can fly so high? Maybe sometimes you're jealous when you look at folks who have no respect for God and yet they seem to be flying so high. Here's what I would say. Keep watching. Because sooner or later, they will run out of gas, they will crash, and they will be destroyed. You see, when you fly your life without God in the pilot seat of your life, that is what happens. That's why the scriptures tell us to not be envious of those who do evil. Just because they're making money, just because they're getting ahead by doing wrong, don't get jealous of them. Because one can only fly on their own for a while, but there will come a point when they run out of gas and they discover an abrupt way that there is a God who is the Lord of the universe. The depth, friends, the beauty of this psalm 
is the steadfastness of God. I love how Eugene Peterson paraphrases verse 4 of this psalm. He says this, but God wouldn't put up with it. He sticks with it, with us. God wouldn't put up with it. He sticks with us. He goes on to say, in reflecting on this psalm, he says, perseverance is not the result of our determination. It is the result of God's faithfulness. We survive in the way of faith, not because we have extraordinary stamina, but because God is righteous, because God sticks with us. Christian discipleship is a process of paying more and more attention to God's righteousness and less and less attention to our own. Coram Deo, he is the God who holds us. He is the God who keeps us. No matter what afflictions we may face, we know that the gospel causes them to work for our good. Consider Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. In reflection of chapter 11, the author of Hebrews has just gone through this laundry list of people who have been faithful to God. And he says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. The author of Hebrews calls us to set our perspective in place. Consider all those who've gone before us. But more than that, consider Jesus himself. Look, yes, you may have endured struggles, but nothing compares to the martyrs. And even more than that, nothing compares to what Christ has endured, that you could have a hope beyond hope. I shared this quote a few weeks ago, and I just keep coming back to it, and I was like, I'm going to read it again. So if you're tired of it, I'm sorry. I don't know how you could be. But this is from an amazing book called A Gospel Primer by Milton Vincent, and it's just so good. It's played through my mind all week. This is what he says. More than anything else could ever do, the gospel enables me to embrace my tribulations and thereby position myself to gain full benefit from them. For the gospel is the one great permanent circumstance in which I live and move and every hardship in my life is allowed by God only because it serves his gospel purposes in me. When I view my circumstances in this light, I realize that the gospel is not just one piece of good news that fits into my life somewhere among all the bad. I realize instead that the gospel makes genuinely good news out of every other aspect of my life, including my severest trials. The good news about my trials is that God is forcing them to bow to his gospel purposes and do good unto me by improving my character and making me more conformed to the image of Christ. Some of you ought to print that out, put it in your car, and read it every day. Because we take the gospel and we make it little. And Jesus wants us to see it as big in our lives. As we face the trials of life, we must keep our faces turned towards Jesus and his gospel truths so that we can keep in the forefront of our minds what the purposes of these trials are for. Ultimately, these trials, friends, are for our good. How so? Because through our trials, we're being conformed into the image of Christ. This is why Jesus teaches us to pray for provision and protection. Just before we went through the Psalms of Ascent, we went through the Lord's Prayer. I know it's been a minute since we were there, but man, what a beautiful prayer for us to go back to. So, if I go to the gym and lift weights, and I know you're looking at me like, yeah, we believe that. If I go to the gym and I lift weights, I'm experiencing a burden with purpose, right? 
I work out with a partner, if you work out with a partner or a trainer, their purpose in placing more weight is, is for you, right, to develop, to grow. The purpose of, of lifting those weights is to build muscle. Now, if someone took that same weight and threw it at you, their purpose would be to harm you. The same weight causes pain, but not for the same reason. One pain is to develop you. Another pain is to harm you. God allows trials in the life of the believer to develop them. Satan, the enemy, he brings trials and temptations into the life of the believer to destroy them. And sometimes it's the exact same event. When you understand what God is doing, and when you understand what the enemy is doing, then you understand why Jesus teaches us to pray and to set our focus on the kingdom. If you're learning how to drive, and the man next to you grabs the wheel to help you stay straight, that's good. They're teaching you. But when you get in the car with someone who wants to hurt you, who jerks the wheel, that's to cause damage or danger. So when Jesus says pray for protection, he's saying pray that God leads you into those things. Leads you into the things that are good for your development and never to let the enemy get a hold of you for the things that are for your destruction. That's the prayer. Lead me, Lord, not into anything that will tear me down. Only lead me into those things that will build me up in you. Deliver me from evil. Listen, Corndale, I cannot emphasize this enough. The enemy wants to take all of the affliction, all of the pain of your life, everything that you've ever felt, any moment that has been a moment of despair, and use all of it to rip your eyes off of Jesus, the founder of your faith. He wants you to wallow in despair. He wants you to have no hope. He wants to break you down. He wants to undo you, yet he will not prevail against you. He cannot, because the snake-crushing king has come to undo him. Lean on the Lord. He will cause you to persevere. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are so good to us. Your love, God, is unending. We, God, often look to other things to satisfy us. God, we often put our hope in broken things. But Jesus, you lovingly, graciously call us back to life in you. And so, Lord, this morning, would we see that you are the God who causes us to persevere. You are the God who is for our good because it brings you glory. May we live for you, Lord. God, may we see those moments when we're tempted to scream out in despair or frustration. That, Lord, you call us to be like the psalmist, honest. But not to let the enemy gain a foothold in our heart that leads us to bitterness and despair. Instead, Lord, to bring that pain, that burden, and lay it down at the foot of the cross. May we do that this morning, Jesus. Pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.